All right, uh, welcome. It's Ethan Mussolini, the Merchant of Success. And today we're going to talk about becoming the most valuable employee 2.0. That means I've done this program before and we are looking at version 2.0. Uh, you know, when you look at the world in general, how things are, I mean, the, we have so many employees and it means if they are valuable, the organizations or the companies they work with, they are also valuable. If they do not increase their value, the value of the organization reduces. You see, you always hear that the most valuable asset in any organization is, is the people in there. And that's absolutely true because there is no limit to the value of a human being. There is a limit to the value of a machine, as an example. If anything, most machines, they keep depreciating in value. And yet for a human being, if you keep improving, if you do the skill set, if you deploy the strategies and the mindsets I'm going to show you, then your value will keep increasing. Okay. Now, these are the five components that I go through when I'm teaching. And that is clarity, knowing what and the why, then the mindsets required, the strategies to make sure that that uh, component is a success, the skill sets, and of course, the mastery. How do you own this information? Let's start with the clarity. Now, when, when we talk about becoming valuable, we talk about things like being an initiator. We talk about being a, a team player, because if you, you know, that there, are, that there are no losers in a winning team, just like there are no winners in a losing team. Yeah, therefore team play is one of those core bits and pieces. Being innovative, can you bring new things to the table? Are you pragmatic? You look at the situation and say, you know what? This is the path we are taking and you look for the most practical path. Are you professional? And, and when we say professional, by the way, in my view, it is even the little things uh, that in my view matter. Uh, because I recall one gentleman who was uh, an executive in uh, one of the big companies. He used to work, he used to be a senior executive at the Africa level in Coca-Cola. I had him say, I was facilitating a session, and I had him say, say, you know what, I value the little things because the little things matter. For example, keeping time. May not sound like a big deal, but for me, I'm always keen on such things because it's something as simple as that, keeping time speaks volumes about you. Are you a performer? And these are things we'll be looking at. What does it mean to perform? Are you solutions focused? This is something I preach and have talked about for, you know, for as long as I can remember, okay? Are you a conflict resolver? Or are you a conflict creator? You see, there, there are people who create conflicts and there are those who resolve conflicts. <laughs> and you'll discover that you're, you are one of those. So are you a resolver or a creator of conflict? Are you ambitious or just a little things, you know, just average is enough for you? I, I remember my wife admires ambitious people. Sometimes it's a time we were living uh, when was uh, well, I, won't, I don't need to tell you where we were staying then but i remember he has seeing um someone with a very huge car and then he said oh wow that guy is ambitious so like oh okay i took note and so ambition ambition is a good thing not to be and that doesn't mean not being appreciative of where you are at it's also aiming for more I was uh, talking to my daughter. I don't know what it was. Yeah, so there's something she she noticed uh, from our neighbors that the, the children had there and she noticed that we didn't have or she didn't have. And she started, um, you know, she became moody. And I told her, sweetheart, look, have you noticed that you have this and they don't have that? I say, yeah, I said, look, there are things they will have and you may not have, and there are things you have and they may not have. I said, look, you need to learn how to appreciate what you have. And it's okay to desire more, but please be thankful for what you have. And just pray to God and say, God, please, I will also appreciate it if you give me this. So ambition does not mean being discontent. It means aiming for more. Being positive, all 
all right? Um, being positive is, yeah, because when you think about it, when you're negative, it really drains the organization. It drains the, the team. It drains the energy of the team. It makes people start to think about things that are not useful. And yet when you're positive, that's energy, that's positive energy. That positive energy adds value to the team. It adds value to the organization. That positive energy lifts the team and then automatically you increase, in, then automatically your value uh, in the eyes of those listening to you or looking at you automatically goes high. So why is this subject important of being the most valuable employee? You see, career growth stems from how you perform in your current job role. Okay. It's not something you imagine, it's not something you think, it's not something you cry about or, or bother your team about. And uh, notice we have some leaders of organizations. We have uh, executive directors here and, and um, other authorities that do hire indeed in this, in this room right now. And they will tell you that when they are considering whether to you know, give you a pay rise or give you a bigger role, or even if it is someone poaching you wanting to hire you from that entity, they first look at how you're performing right now. The second key to note is that the job market is getting more competitive by the day. You must prove why your existence is needed. Every day you must prove yourself. Do you know what's amazing? Even if you're going to offer something for free to someone, they, it has to be valuable, period. Even more so when you're being paid for it. I was sharing today, uh, today I was sharing something on my uh, Facebook Live and I was telling them, look, a couple of years ago, decades ago, just having a bachelor's degree was enough to make you super valuable. These days, uh -uh. you might have a master's or even a PhD and people don't look your way. Or you were, I mean, we have some people who have PhDs who are on the streets as we speak. I met a gentleman and on the streets about two years ago, when I think about it, it almost brings chills to my, to my back. This is what he told me, he said, Ethan, I have a master's program, I have a master's, um, and I've been on the streets for two years. Do you think it's okay if I go and wash utensils at one of the hotels? Because that opportunity is available right now. master's degree. Again, that's not to say that washing utensils or people who wash utensils are not valuable. That's not to say that it's a demeaning job. All I'm saying is it's almost unthinkable, at least when I look at when I was growing up thinking about education and all that, to think that someone could have a master's and be on the streets for two years and is desperate enough to think and consider getting a job to wash utensils. The reason I'm bringing that point to you is to show you how competitive the marketplace is. And that's why whenever I'm talking to people, I tell them, look, do not take your job for granted. I know for us who are attending live, at least over 90% of us have jobs that are based on the, the what have, based on our stats. Now I'll tell you, if you have a job, please do not take it for granted. And for us who don't have jobs yet, once you get one, please treat it like gold because it is, it is a golden opportunity. See, if you aspire to start your own organization or company, you must apply yourself in your current job. This is what I usually tell people. I usually ask people, say, okay, how many of us are considering being self-employed or running your own business? And over 90% of the arms go up in the workshops I've led. And my advice always has been, listen, if that's what you want to be or do, then behave like you are indeed the owner of this organization. By the way, even if it's not that you want to have your own business, but you want to become like an ED or MD or CEO, then behave like one. Treat everything as if you're the CEO. 
then you'll be conditioning your brain, you'll be conditioning your conscious mind and unconscious mind to think, behave, and pick up details and information for what a leader of an organization would pay attention to. So in other words, you'd get paid to learn. So you do not become a, a passenger, you become an active participant, you become a driver within that organization. You don't just, uh, just cross your legs and look the other way around, no. You become so conscious, you pay so much attention as if indeed you're the head of the organization. Then you'll be picking up information and training in that moment. Now let's talk about the mindset. Let's explore the six mindsets that a valuable employee ought to have. Number one is business ownership mindset. You see that an owner is interested in the performance, numbers, interest in the welfare of others, doing all that it takes to see success. That's how a business performer thinks and behaves. So are you a business owner or a business passenger? Are you an organizational uh, practitioner or you're an organizational passenger? When I say, pass it, okay, let me put it the other way around. Are you a spectator or are you an active participant in the performance of the organization you're in? Because once you have the mindset of a business, you're, you're keen on the numbers, you're keen to make sure that the welfare of others is good. You, you do what, all that it takes to succeed. That's the, the mindset. Now you might say, oh, but I don't own it. Well, and I'm telling you that thought of I don't own it again will keep you behind. I believe I hinted on that some uh, either yesterday or sometime, something like that. So that is that I'm just showing you the, the mindsets of people who are leaders, who are super valuable. And trust me, I've dealt with many of them. Uh, you know, most of, because most of my clients, they are CEOs and directors or one level below. So I know how they think, and this is how they think. Whether they are owners of the business or not, this is how they think. The other uh, mindset that is valuable is to is to always remember that your job description is just the beginning. It's minimum expectation. I know I've hinted on this before under branding, but I have to reemphasize it again. It's even more crucial on this perspective. I mean, from this uh, particular course, the job description, that is minimum expectation. So if you are just stuck on what your job description says, then it means you're ultimately offering the bare minimum. Meaning the mindset should be, what more can I do? Because what bothers me is oftentimes you see people saying, but they are giving me that work to do and it's not part of my job description. Wrong mindset, my friend. The good news is I can talk about you because I don't, you know, and you know what, by the time we are done by the, for the day, you will, each one of us would have gotten a segment for you. So if you're the type that complains and whines about extra responsibility, then you're telling God, I do not want to work. And you know what the Bible says that those who don't work, don't eat. And I might say, yeah, but I have this work already. Yes. But if it is under the reins of the organization, then you ought to work or you ought to execute that. Now, if it's outside the reins of the organization, because I've all, I, one day I also heard of some head of a certain organization who used to take um, one of the staff members to, you know, to work in his house or something like that. Now that's outside the reign of the organization, in my view. But other than that, if it's to contribute to the growth or sustenance of the organization or business, then you ought to do it. So long as it is legal, moral, and ethical, okay? Uh, because if it is also something illegal or immoral, now that's a totally different conversation. And I do not, I wouldn't support that myself. 
The other mindset that is priceless is the initiative mindset. You need to be known for taking initiatives that build the organization on the business. Every organization wants growth and they will value whoever gives them growth initiatives. Now, this doesn't matter whether you're in a for-profit or non-for-profit, it doesn't matter. Are you the kind that pushes the envelope to say, okay, if we did this, we would go to another level. If only we could do this, we would go to another level. Now, I'm also aware that sometimes you could be that type and you receive lots of resistance or people don't want to listen to you. Now, that's a different matter also. Then you need to learn two things. Number one, you, you need to learn how to influence people so they can listen to you and take action. Um, that's why the series I talked about, Persuasion 101, that's option one. Option two, if you push and still people are not open, it might mean that indeed you go to a place, uh, to another organization where your talents will be appreciated, where you can fully express yourself. But I will tell you, I will, come, I will tell you that indeed always when you are able to set initiatives in place or convince people to, to participate in your initiatives for the good of the organization, then your value in the organization automatically grows because now they know this is someone who is helping us to grow. This is someone who is always proposing how to make things happen. Not just push, pushing your personal agendas, but pushing the organizational agenda. And that's, that's the difference also. There are people who push for initiatives just for, uh, for their own selfish interests. And I'm saying, I'm talking about you pushing for an agenda where you know that genuinely, if this is implemented, the organization will move forward. We'll get more funders, we'll serve our customers better, we'll generate more business, we'll do this. So if you're that kind, and if you're not, then please start thinking, meaning before you go to sleep and you think, okay, what is the initiative that would be valuable to my team? What initiative would be valuable to the organization? What initiative would uh, do we need to have in place that would push us to this next level? The other mindset is the no, no excuses policy. Either you report on results or excuses. <laughs> oh, Lord, this is a biggie. This is a big one right here. If you can just pay attention to this one and you execute it accordingly, you'll be amazed. You see, there are two kinds of people. There are those who report excuses and there are those who report results. You can't report both. What's the biggest disease? It is a disease called excusitis. Excuse after excuse. You know, this couldn't happen because of this, because of this. I would have done this, but the moment you hear but, then you're batting around. Report results. And if the results are not there, they say, you know what? I apologize. Tomorrow I will be able to do it. Because, I mean, there are those extraordinary circumstances where not able to deliver results. Don't go into explaining, giving us a whole plethora of stories around why something couldn't be done. Find a way. Find a way to create the results. Be known as a results person. Find a way to create results, then explain the Recording. process later. So the, the key thing here is to remind yourself always that you're paid to produce results. You're never paid to report excuses or stories. Now, I can say this comfortably since um, you, I'm not even seeing you. I don't know who reports excuses, but if you're a manager or a leader, this is the mindset you need to drive into people's minds. And if you're that kind also, first wipe it out of your mind and then share it with the rest of the team. The, my colleagues at Success Africa know that I do not entertain excuses. I tell them, look, find a way and then tell me later and tell me how what you spent and then we look at how to refund. But don't give me an excuse that I couldn't do this because of, if it is within your reach. If it is, if it is not within your reach, that's another matter. But I'd never want to hear an excuse over something that is within your reach, meaning there were some options you could have engaged to solve something. No, I don't entertain that. Uh, my, some of my colleagues are here like they know that because I know that's not where growth is. How do I know? Because I've given so many excuses 
uh, before, and sometimes I catch myself giving excuses even at this stage. Notice the word also, I catch myself. So meaning I'm not 100% immune from excuses myself. And please take it from me, it is extremely costly. So you and I need to make a commitment to stop giving excuses, whether at the workplace or even in our personal lives. If you can do that, then your value automatically goes up. Valuable employees find a way and less valuable employees find excuses. Valuable employees find ways to produce the results and less valuable employees look for ways to create stories or why something could not be done. The other mindset is the lifelong learner mindset. Learn and teach others. Are you learning? Are you growing? That's why I was talking about personal branding some time back, how, you know, and, and uh, my wife caught on this and then she told me, yeah, I'm going to make sure I sleep with less ignorance today. So far, that was our biggest takeaway. So are you learning every day? Are you growing? Are you learning something? Because for you to become valuable, you have to have valuable skills. You must have valuable knowledge. When I say valuable knowledge, not everything you consume is valuable for you. If you're just there consuming gossip and all this kind of stuff, then that's not valuable information. You have extra information, but is it valuable? Is it adding value to you? I'm not sure about that. It's not making you valuable. It's making your brain engaged, yes. If you're just looking for brain engagement, yes, you're engaged. But are you increasing your value? And value comes from you owning, learning valuable skills and you deploying those skills at your workplace. And that's why I'm saying learn and teach others. What you don't teach, you lose. What you don't teach, you lose. Learn something, teach it. See, I'm teaching right now. Guess who is benefiting the most? Me. <laughs> because I'm learning a lot. I'm also getting insights in the moment, the questions you ask me. Uh, and of course, as I'm teaching it, I'm mastering it. You, when you teach something, you master it. That's why when we were in high school or even at the university, we are always encouraged to discuss things for others. If you recall, I, I was sharing this in uh, Succeeding Daily Mastermind, uh, which I, I run every Wednesday. It's a smaller group where I give people personal attention, close attention to personal and career development. So one of the things, one of the examples I gave them, I said, look, you remember when we were in, in high school, the people who used to hoard information like hide books or hide pamphlets and all that, I can guarantee you most likely those people did not succeed or pass. But those who were always generous and sharing and teaching others, their percentage of success was much, much higher. Not that everyone passed, but I will tell you that compared to those who are just hoarding, you can't compare the two. So learn, meaning grow, learn and grow and teach others. You see, also when you teach others, they will come back to teach you. That's the beauty. The sixth mindset is the abundance mindset. You need to think that there's enough for everyone. Give information, keep others in the loop. Do you know that almost in every organization I've engaged with uh, since 2003, you always hear of characters who hoard, hide things because they feel, because we are in the information age, they feel that the, the more they know and the other people, the less they know that the more valuable they become. No! Your value is based on how you're helping others to become more valuable. Share. Keep others in the loop. It's not the end of the world. I know of a certain, of someone who was working for a certain international organization, I'm talking about a global organization. And so this was a junior person and this junior person asked the senior person say, can you teach me how to do this? And then the senior person asked, talked, responded to the junior and said, okay, if I teach you then what will be my job? I'm like, 
Are you kidding me? So why don't you teach other, this other junior person and then you upgrade to a higher position? Who tells you that you've reached the climax? And mind you, this was like, assuming the organization has 10 levels, this was like level four. Meaning there are so many other levels. So such a person will never grow if they keep in that mindset, that mentality. There's another teacher of mine I've been attending to recently and he was sharing with us um, how at one time he was, you know, the number one in the organization in terms of sales and all this. So he went to the boss and said, but you, um, I, I mean, I'm bringing some, the most valuable person in this organization and you're not even giving me a pay rise. And the boss looked at him and said, you know what? You are the least valuable. You know why? Because you just, it's only you who knows what you know. You never share with anyone. You never teach someone. You never empower anyone. So you know what? You are the least valuable. The most valuable are those who empower others. And my friend, that's the mindset that you need to have because in that moment, you're demonstrating leadership. In that moment, you're demonstrating high level abundance. And when you're abundant, the world becomes abundant to you. Because then you're helping others to multiply. So meaning you're multiplying yourself. What, what makes the seed valuable is not the seed staying as is in the soil. What makes the seed valuable is when it sprouts and then has other seeds that have grown. And you know what? It takes that seed dying fast to give birth. So you need to, to let your ego die. You need to let your, your fears die. You need to let your small thinking die. You need to let your being that scarcity mindset die. And then once you have that abundant mindset and you help others to thrive, to grow, to expand, then now they can look back at you and say, wow, look at what he did to me. And that wording alone, there are people saying good things about you alone. Those are blessings. That's what makes you grow, not people groaning and crying, how you, you hold things, how you, you hide things and how you make others feel small and how you're insecure. No, people's positive thoughts and thankfulness, that alone, those are showers of blessings that make you grow and expand. And not only do you expand, the organization is expanding because you've come. Think about it. Two managers hired on the same day. One is teaching others, multiply itself by five, by a factor of five, by teaching five other people. The other one still stays as is. And in fact, this other person one performs at 50% better than manager two in terms of actual results. I will tell you, I would rather to still take manager one who has multiplied himself. That's how you increase your value. All right. So, We've had the clarity, we have the mindsets. Now let's talk about the strategies that would enable you to become super valuable. These are the five strategies for being a valuable employee. The first strategy is best, is being the best. Strategy, okay? You see organizations are looking for professionals, people who are good at their trade. You need to learn from the best. You apply yourself. You do your job well. And this strategy efforts are geared towards your technical ability. You add value, you follow protocol, you extend it to make sure that you're even better than most. So that's strategy number one. Um, I believe I hit it on this last time, but for the benefit of some of us who are new, uh, you know, I have a friend of mine, for him, he committed himself that he is going to be the most is going to make himself the number one banking executive in Africa. And I know he's going to hit that goal based on where he's at now. And he's in his early 40s. I know he will hit that goal. So that means you look for ways and means to be the best of the best. You go beyond excellence. You aim to be outstanding. So meaning your technical uh, proficiency or your technical abilities are beyond reproach. They are beyond question. Then besides that, you also need to look at leadership. What do we call the leadership strategy? 
And this I hinted on earlier, you look beyond position. So what you do is one of the ways to make yourself super valuable, always look for ways to offer leadership. You accept tasks and responsibilities that impact on your leadership. And of course, you're a hard worker. You, you put in your best effort. Besides putting in your best effort, you look for opportunities where you will lead and manage things. Let me give you a quick tip here. Next time they're asking for someone to volunteer to take charge of a project, take charge of an initiative, raise your hand. If you don't raise your hand, you will not be raised. If you're not willing to raise your neck, to stick your neck out and say, here I am, I'm willing to, do, I'm willing to put in the extra hours. Of course, that's not what you say. Because usually when they give you these extra responsibilities, it means you're putting extra time, extra energy. When others are going to have fun, you're putting in that midnight candle, so to speak. But you see, before God can raise you up, you need to raise yourself up. You need to raise your hand and say, here I am, send me. That's why the Bible says that the... the Harvest is plenty, but the workers or those who can harvest are few. When you say the harvest is plenty, we mean opportunity is in plenty, but few are willing to step up. And you know what is bothersome? Usually people who are not willing to step up, those are the first ones to complain when the other party fails. But the opportunity was there. Why didn't you step up? to take charge of that opportunity and show us what you've got. Many are willing to complain, few are willing to take full responsibility. I'm on fire now. <laughs> I told you this is a subject I'm so passionate about because the world is crying for leaders and all of us, I believe we have something that we can do beyond our job description or what we are meant to do to take responsibility, take some leadership responsibility of some sort. And when I say leadership, it doesn't have to be big. It could be a birthday party for someone at the workplace. Can you lead? Can you take advantage of the opportunities before you? You know, in, in finance, they say that, um, I, I overheard someone at church one day who was saying, you know, the key is not to seek for the harvest, it is to seek for the seed, the seed you plant, because you know once you have seed and you plant it, then it will grow, then you finally have the harvest. When I look at this particular strategy, the job is not to look for a pay rise, a better paying job. The job should be, your number one prayer should be, God, give me the opportunity where I can express the gifts you've given me. Give me a leadership opportunity. Give me an opportunity where I can take charge. Give me an opportunity where I can showcase your, your blessings, your glory, your, your, the talents and gifts you gave me. Because that's what you need. You just need an opportunity where you can step up and showcase. And my friend, for that to happen, you just need to focus your mind on exactly that, seeking for opportunity looking for opportunity. And when that opportunity comes, make sure you maximize it. Because some people get opportunities and they blow them, they waste them. And then after that, they start complaining, ah, those people, they don't like me. Can you imagine? Look, they over criticize me. No, they are not over criticizing you. You're playing small. You're not adding the value that you're supposed to do to add a bigger pattern. So seek for opportunity. Pray for opportunity. And once it comes, my friend, do not play around with it. Do not mess around with it. Maximize it. That's something I believe in very, very strongly. Because in any case, the Bible tells us that those, to those who are, uh, well, you know, I need to remember the word. If you're a good steward of the little, then you get more. Okay, I forget the, the, the exact wording to okay, now I'm lost in so many uh, thoughts and, and things that I'm doing right now. But you see, you have to, to showcase that you're a great steward of the little, then God will give you more. So once you have the opportunity, please become a great steward. The next strategy is the people strategy. Okay. 
the people strategy. Yeah, thank you, Patricia. To whom much is given, much is required. Okay, though that's a different, yeah, that one is true also. That was looking the, you know, you just have to be a great steward for whatever that you have. I mean, if you're given little before you're given much, show me that you're a great steward of the little. Then once you're a great steward of the little, then I can give you more. When Kabgo had just started with me about 10 years ago, fresh from campus, he had, his vote was he could spend 50,000, the part above the talents, okay? Matthew 25, thank you, Emily. So the, the thing is he had, his vote was 50,000. Then he showed me that he was a good steward of the 50,000 Uganda shillings, which is about what? That's about $14 or $13. Then I doubled it. Then I kept doubling it. Then I kept doubling it. <laughs> now he can spend thousands of dollars without my, you know, without consulting me. But he has proven himself to be a good steward. People strategy, make alliances across the organization, grow other people, pay attention to others, respect for others, offer support. What more can I do to help you? Be interested in other people's lives. That question of what more can I do to help you? That's one of the most important questions you can ask your colleagues. Do you focus on people? And not only that, but also to just stretch beyond and be interested in other people's lives. Do you know that, do you have an idea that they have children? Do you have an idea that they are doing farming? Do you have an idea? Because usually when I'm teaching managers and leaders about motivating their employees, I always tell them, please develop interest in people's lives. Go beyond just asking for a report at the end of the week or at the end of the month. What more can you ask? Be interested in other people's lives because once you are you're adding value because you see you never know some of us are gifted as counselors some of us are gifted as encouragers some of us are gifted as analysts and you see when you develop it you could develop you could add an ear you could de uh, deposit something very positive in someone's life there and then and then in that moment you're becoming valuable in the eyes of that person and guess what you're adding value to the overall entity or the overall organization. So that's the people's strategy. The other strategy is the inner game strategy. This to me is one of the most important, if not the most important. You see your attitude towards others and your job, your commitment, your love and caring for the organization, your mentality towards extra tasks, all these determine your performance. The inner game is you working on your attitude, how you think. Do you have emotional baggage? Release it. Pray to God to release it. Talking about, uh, not garbage, but baggage. You see, if, you, if you're the kind, for example, I've had stories since I'm a guy, I can comfortably say this. I've had stories of guys who have issues having a lady being the leader or their boss. That's, that's baggage you're carrying, my friend. Release it. Release it. Why? Release it. Or someone just hates men and I'm saying, release that baggage. Just because some guy, some dude, you know, or some male manager behaved in a very funny way, that doesn't mean that every male person is bad. Or it could be just because uh, you had a, you're a guy and you had a lady as your boss and treated you badly, that doesn't mean that all ladies are like that. Release that baggage because it will block you, it will block your thinking. Then you're in a meeting, someone is delivering valuable insights. And you're like, oh, she's a lady after all. I know, yeah, women are like that. That noise in your head cannot process information. If, you, if you're uh, struggling with stuff at home, for example, find a counselor, get a coach, uh, read, invest in yourself. My biggest uh, investment is always on, on, on my personal and professional growth because I know I have to become a better person in all aspects of my life. So work on your inner game. 
your attitude, how you think and how you're feeling is going to impact how you interact with the rest of the world. So that when you enter the office, people see a ball of energy. So that when you're going out to represent your organization, they say, wow, I would want to work where that guy works. I would want to work where that lady works. Because if you have a lot of baggage on you, people will feel it. You, you feel, I'm sure, I don't know about you, but if I'm around people, I will, you know, there are people you stand next to and you can tell that they have a negative vibe. Like you can feel it. How many of you feel that sometimes? You sit, stand or sit next to someone and you can feel the energy or the vibe is heavy. It's negative, it's not uplifting. And there are people you sit or stand next to and you feel like their vibe is uplifting, like you want to stay around. They have not even said anything, but you feel it. If, if you've ever experienced that, type the word yes, if, if that makes sense, what I've just said. Yeah, Patricia framed it right, uh, what I was looking for. If you are faithful in small things, you'll be faithful in large ones. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm seeing yes, 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 yes. I'm seeing so many yeses. Emotional baggage keeps one in the box. You only torture yourself and colleagues' performance, Patricia says. Yeah, I'm seeing so many yeses. So, and that, my friend, is costly to the organization, to the team. Because now think about it. You enter the team, you're seated next to someone, you know, you can imagine sitting next to that person, you're working on a report or a project, you're going to be bothered. So meaning, ultimately, they are sucking energy out of you. They are sucking energy out of the organization. So please work on your mindset, on your attitude. And one of the quickest ways, by the way, let me give you a quick tip. Be grateful. Find ways to be grateful. Godfrey says you power your, your garbage on to others. Yes. You see, once again, uh, to quote, uh, I believe it's when I will say that we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. Uh, we are spiritual beings having a human experience, meaning your spirit, which is your inner game, that's what is interacting with the other person's spirit. That's why you can feel it. They don't tell you, they don't pronounce it. Here I am, negative attitude. By the way, I have a lot of emotional baggage. I have a lot of, no, they don't have to say it. You feel it in your spirit, in your vibration. So that's what is interacting with people. That's why you, you will notice that there are some, that's why you hear some doctors, you go to them and, and they, they just being in their presence, you feel better. Why? Because of the, 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 the energy they bring. Those who are so loving, if those who have such a loving spirit, a caring spirit, then that energy alone is healing. So as much as possible, please work on your emotional baggage, please then indirectly you'll be adding value to the organization. Focus on having a positive vibe, okay? If I may add, besides being grateful, be positive and you know, have positive affirmation. Look for the good in people. That's the other way, by the way, to, to be more valuable. Look for the good in people because if all you're doing, you're only looking for the negative, that's, that's negativity you're bringing to the game as much as possible. Then if something is not working, again, ask a question that is solutions focus. Okay, how can we do this? How can we solve this? See, the, the, there's a difference between, ah, you guys, we are really not performing. This is annoying. This is stressful. This, is, uh, this even gives me a headache. Now that's a complainer. That's, that's emotional baggage you're bringing to the table, my friend. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. Instead, a solutions energy you bring is, okay, guys, I'm not saying we can do much better with our performance. What can we do here? Can we generate some solutions on how to do this? See, that's the difference. Next is the results performance strategy. Focus on results, delivering on targets, beating deadlines and delivering great value is what every employee is looking for. No, it's what every employer is looking for, I beg your pardon. Um, that was, yeah. Results, results. That's what employers are looking for. That's what I, every employer is looking for. So, meaning be results driven. Not what you can get, because again, that's the mindset. There are those who, once they move in, they are thinking, okay, what can I get? What can I get? What can I get? A results performer is thinking, okay, what can I give today to deliver great results? That's the, that's the strategy you, sh you should carry and then deliver on those results. 
Okay. So, so one, one of the issues and one of the questions that has just popped up is what do you do when you've been betrayed? You know, you, you, someone is asking, you know, for the people's strategy, Godfrey is asking for the people's strategy. Sometimes you do good things and people instead do bad things in return and they betray you or they do not deliver in kind. They do not do good things even after you're doing all these positive things. What do you do? How do you deal with that? Here is my thought process. Number one, forgive those people. That's why Christ said that forgive them for they do not know what they are doing because in the end they are hurting themselves, trust me. I know that for a while it may appear and seem as if you're the only one being hurt, but I will tell you in the long term they are hurting themselves even more. So forgive them. Number two, when I say forgive them, you're doing yourself a favor because it can be uh, painful indeed. I've had those experiences myself, a few of those, not so many, but a few of those. So I, I will tell you that one of the best gifts you can give yourself is to forgive those people because you're doing yourself a favor. If you keep that heart and you keep in that frame of, you know, you see, you know, I, can you imagine, can you imagine? Well, you don't have control. Number three, my other mindset uh, and encouragement to you, good friend, I can tell you a, a good person by the time you say this, is you can only control what you do for people. You cannot control how they respond to you. You have zero control. So my encouragement to you, God, my good friend Godfrey, is just do your best. I always tell people, you do your best, God does the rest. I have an auntie of mine. She's in her 50s now. She's one of the most generous people I've ever seen. She, I, I mean, uh, God bless her heart. She's still alive, by the way. When I say God bless her, I do not think that she's passed on. Uh, she's still alive and... Uh, God did not bless her with children. And I have a feeling as if God framed it that way so that she can take care of us. Because in my clan, I mean, we have so many orphans. So it's as if, you know, God put her on planet Earth to do that for us. That's my assumption. I could be wrong. But she's extremely generous. And I will tell you, she's helped so many of us. I mean, I'm sure like dozens, if not hundreds, about hundreds have gone through her hands. But I will tell you, I can count the people who have paid her back in return in terms of taking care of her on my hand like this, diligently, like this. Luckily, I'm one of those, like this. But you know what? She's being taken care of. And you know, I sometimes say, can you imagine you're like, you know what, auntie? That's, that's it, it's okay, we are here. At least we are here. So her job was to take care of those people. And then it's God's job to determine who is to take care of her. And ultimately, God, you know what my other encouragement is? You're here, you are alive, you're well. Doesn't matter what those people did to you, you are in MPG right now, streaming live, learning these things, benefiting and all this. You know what? You gave those people all those benefits. Guess what? You're here also benefiting. That's how God does. You, you sow your seeds. It's God who determines which channel you'll be blessed. It's not you to control that if I give Joan these blessings, that Joan must bless me back. No. You bless Joan. It's God to determine which source of a blessing is going to be for you. Because I will tell you, if I was to ask you, and I'm sure you can have found this, God has also blessed you in many other ways that were not in your control. You're like, wow, this is definitely God. So you blessed them and God blessed you in other channels and he's still blessing you and will continue blessing you. So my encouragement to you is that should never stop you to encourage others to invest in others, to bless others, to pray for others, to love others, to care for others, because in one way or the other, it's God who determines the channel, the source of those blessings. He, listen to this. I, I learned recently that you see, people are not your source. They are just channels. 
So what you're doing here is you want to control the channel. And I'm saying, no, it's God who determines the channel. God is the source, so to speak. So God is the one who determines the channel to get these blessings. So you're getting this wisdom. That's, 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 so God is using me as one of the channels to bless you, so to speak. Now, now those, the, those, those are some of the dividends you're getting for the seeds you sowed. Because you're, I mean, you're a consultant, you're a teacher. I mean, you've taught others, and now here God brings another teacher into your life. Boom, blesses you. <laughs> so be encouraged, my friend. Keep the people's strategy; it's perfectly fine. And let me know if I've answered your question. The skill sets, all right. The skill sets for becoming most valuable. Uh, all right. <laughs> Someone is saying that they are sweating. Cool, good for you. I want us to use the Spark model that you can use to become valuable. Because with this Spark model, then you'll be in a much better place. Trust me. When it begins. So I find it to be super easy to remind you of these concepts. So meaning you should, uh, my seven year old's uh, favorite song is shine like a diamond. So you need to have that spark, not only in your eyes, but a spark in your performance. So just remind that, I want you to be a true spark in your organization's growth. So spark is an acronym, the S stands for support. Help your colleagues to excel, support others to shine. Remember when they shine, that part of their light bounces off and hits your face. You also shine. Enable others to perform. Support organizational initiatives. Ask for support when you are in need and the workplace will be a better place for you. So always think support. How can I support others? And when you need support, please speak up. Now, I've had stories of people when they need support, they keep quiet or they imagine that if they speak up, then they will look as incompetent or not uh, proficient in their work. And I'm saying that's a wrong mentality. So the mentality is not just for you to support, but also be willing to seek support. Also, please be aware, again, this goes back to the baggage question. I've also had stories because uh, person A, does not support person B, then they keep fighting. You do not support their initiatives. You think that you're making Joan or James to lose out, or you're making them fail to look bad because you disagree with them or they didn't support you in a project or because they didn't put your name on a certain juicy opportunity. You think you're stopping or making that other person fail, but what you're actually doing is you're making the organization fail. So when I think about support, I'm also thinking about the big picture idea, the big picture mentality to say, okay, what is the big picture here? The big picture here is you want the organization to succeed. So you may have your disagreements, you may have your fights, and I'm here to propose to you that please find a way to resolve that. And even if you're, you have a fight with someone, that doesn't mean that you cannot support their initiative for the good of the organization. The P stands for passion. Passion for your work, the organization, the organizational goals and values and passion for performance. When I say passion, I always tell people, look, if you really don't love and you're not passionate about the work that you're doing, please, as fast as possible, as fast as humanly possible, start looking for another opportunity. And I really mean that. I say, Ethan, I don't, you, have, you want us to become the most valuable employee in the organization? Yes, go where you'll be valuable. Because if you don't love what you're doing, you're pulling others back. You're not energetic, you're not excited. See, I'm doing this work with passion because I love it. Therefore, I'm able to get ideas in the moment and add value to you. So for me, if you in that role and you don't love it, then you're not being authentic and honest with yourself. You're also not being honest and authentic to the people who hired you. So you need to be in that place where you can 
genuinely love what you're doing. Either you should find a way to love what you're doing now, or you go look for something else that you love doing. Meaning the passion has to be there because passion adds value. It adds energy. It will help you to increase performance. And it also means you must have the passion to produce results. When I was starting out, uh, the, the, the name of the organization that I wanted to have was Mussolini Motivations Worldwide. And the, my catch word was a passion to perform. And I like that word, a passion to perform. I changed it later, of course. But I, I still remember that, a passion to perform. You must have the passion for the organization and a passion for performance. Once you do that, automatically your value will be up. Your value will definitely go higher and it will keep moving higher and higher. On the SPAC uh, acronym again, A stands for attitude. That your attitude determines how you go in any organization. Staying positive gives you an edge in both the professional and social life. So what is your attitude? Is it positive? Are you on the edge? Are you pushing? Is it driven or it's laid back? So at every one moment, you should be checking in. What is my attitude level? What, what, where am I at? On a scale of zero to 10, where 10, my attitude is at the best of the best. Where is my attitude now? And if it's not at a level 10, what do you need to do to make sure that your attitude is at a level 10? So you need to work on your attitude because like I hinted earlier, that affects your energy. And then the R stands for results. Every employer is interested in performance that, that drives the organization forward. If you're driving the organization forward, then automatically your value is high. So, meaning it's not just you being there busy, but you're actually producing results. And later will be one of the programs I'll be talking about productivity. So, and what I usually advise people is do not confuse movement for achievement. Do not confuse being busy for achieving business results. Or do not confuse being busy to be doing stuff that adds value to the organization, results results, results. And K stands for knowledge. Are you technically smart? Not only the technical side, but also you have to work on the soft skills, which we've been focusing on in this series. Things like communication, interpersonal intelligence, or, or what we are tackling now, your attitude towards work, or, or how do you give and receive feedback. These are things we are typically not taught at school, but you have to consciously seek for knowledge, consciously seek out coaches, like Ethan Mussolini and other people out there. Consciously seek out coaches to help you with the soft skills, because I will tell you, from a technical perspective, you will realize that you may have the same qualifications. So what will separate you from the crowd is what we call the soft skill side. How do you deal with people? How do you communicate with people? What's your attitude like? Do you have the emotional intelligence? Talking about emotional intelligence, today I was, I was uh, laying on the bed and my seven year old was uh, attempting to, to get it through the door now. I was amazed. She came and uh, brought some lotion and started massaging my feet. I said, uh, what, is it mommy who asked you to massage me? said, no. said, so how come you're massaging me? said, yeah, because I see you stand a lot. So I felt your feet might need a massage. I was blown away. I was like, wow. She's so emotionally intelligent. It's sometimes incredible. I'm so proud of her. She had that emotional intelligence. Say, no one. If daddy is standing for hours, and by these days I work while standing also, then his feet might need a massage. I was like, thank God for the girls. <laughs> uh, she's seven years old, so the three and a half year old also started 
you know, joined in. Because for her, when she sees her elder sister, what she does, she also does. Uh, in a way, with all due respect, I was thinking, wow, isn't it nice to have girls? Because I would imagine the boys would be just banging my phone down or something like that. Okay, not all boys are like that, but you get to the drift. <laughs> so that's emotional intelligence. And that increases your value in any entity, in any organization. Please work on these soft skills, reach out. Um, and talking about baggage again, in case you, you, you have some emotional stuff that you need help with, I also help with that, with healing the emotional energy. I, I help people heal that at a, an energetic level, not psychological, just talking about stuff, no, at an energetic level where we can wipe out uh, that um, emotional experience or energy. So then with the mastery, this is, uh, which is about your owning this, this is what I want you to think about. How can you employ the spark model in your life and work? So meaning your task or your challenge is every day to ask yourself, am I truly a spark in the organization I'm in? That's your task. So every day ask yourself, am I truly a spark? In this organization and the moment you discover that you're not a spark then you need to engage how can i be more supportive how can i engage more passion how can i have a better attitude how can i boost my performance how can i be how can i increase my knowledge so if you make that the dominant thought you make it a dominant thought a dominant practice a dominant focus then you'll be amazed at how much growth you will experience down the road all right Cool. So does mastery make sense? You focusing on spark, does it make sense? Okay. All right, so Tim, I would need, so what we need to do then next is for the next couple of minutes, just I want us to go forth and for the next few minutes uh, to give us your feedback before we go to the breakout rooms. So I've just typed the feedback form, uh, which is there. And also Nathan has typed in the feedback form. So if you kindly use the next couple of minutes, uh, like six minutes or so, um, maximum seven, I would really, really appreciate that because it makes us, so we're going to discuss these questions. What did you find most useful in this presentation? And how are you going to implement the lessons moving forward in your life, in your career and business, okay? So engage fully. So there are a couple of questions that were asked earlier that I need to respond to. And let me see. Yeah, it should be now. Okay, good. Now I can see them. Okay. So one of the questions was uh, from Noamanyos. How do you deal with a supervisor who normally does not appreciate your work and energy? So uh, normally what my recommendation always is feedback. So you, there are two things. One, give that person feedback. And later we'll be looking at that subject on feedback and I'm going to be super quick, I'll just notice the time. So give that person feedback in terms of, you know what, I would really appreciate it if in future you, if you notice something that I've done that is right, to also let me know what is good about it uh, because it encourages me. Number two, choose to congratulate yourself. When you do great work, even if someone doesn't say nice things, say nice things to yourself. Look at yourself in the mirror and say, well, no, man, you did a fantastic job, well done, I'm proud of you. Because sometimes you may not be able to, you don't have control over how that person will respond to you. Uh, good friend Samantha, we are a good reminder of lifelong learning you shared with us earlier and we are thankful for the practical solutions and the Spark formula, great. Uh, how do you go about a team player with negative attitude? Because it spills out to other team members. Olivier, what I would do is I would take that person on the side and tell them, you know what? 
it would really be very useful for you to be positive because of ABCD, because it uplifts other people's spirits. Um, and usually when I'm giving feedback, as you will learn later, is that it's always good to find out how come I notice you usually very critical of this, what influences you, then get to know the answers and then give them the feedback of why they should consider being very positive, the benefits to the team and the benefits to themselves, okay? And we'll be talking about that in detail on feedback. Uh, if Stephen say you said we should kindly take up duties, sign as long as they are legal and moral. I didn't get that other one. The legal, oh, legal, moral and ethical. Yes, legal, moral and ethical. That's what I meant. Uh, I know there was another, yes, and ethical, someone had answered. Yeah, good, thank you. That was Karunji. I know there's someone who had asked. How do you manage a history of negative? Yeah, that one I answered. There's another question. What can one do if you have a supervisor who does not? Okay, that one I answered. Okay, cool. All right, that seems to be the questions, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, team, unless there's, there's a question I've not uh, responded to, you can paste it in the chat box. Practices said we should. Sylvia says, Ethan, uh, I think today's session was my calling. I've been a regional sales manager for five years and I've been the best performing team. Thus, I thought I would be promoted to another post since I'm having my targets month on year to year to year. To make matters worse, I was given a, a supervisor who is so green to the product and these four years has never added any value to me. However, I engaged my MD about my promotion and his response was, Sylvia, if I promote you and leave that team, I'm worried the performance may decline, which is an effect to the business, meaning I've not worked well on my succession plan, which is really explained better in the Spark model. Thank you so much from today. I'm reverting to this. Yay, fantastic, Sylvia. Well, I'm glad that you got that insight. Yes, so if you're not there, then what? Yeah, good. Soft skills, more like what is required to join the master classes uh, from your end. Uh, Godfrey, call me privately. It is by application only. The mastermind is by application only. Um, you saw my, let me 